Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it's time for episode number 243 of Goulet Q&A. This past, or sorry, this weekend, this weekend, this episode, <laughs> we're going to talk about when to use limited edition ink, the Goulet pen cleaning station, and how pen retailers feel about each other. This weekend, which is now where I mean to talk about the weekend, I had a good family visit. Um, I saw my nutritionist, uh, which is near where Rachel's parents live, which is about two hours from where we are and uh, got a little update. Things are going well for me. Uh, I'm trying to lose a little bit of weight. Uh, so working on some stuff myself. I won't bore you with the details, but um, had a productive time there. But also we got to get our kids together with her sister's kids. So it was four little kids going nuts, having a good time, cousins playing with each other. It was all, a good time was had by all. Um, but uh, it's coming back to reality here at Goulet Pens. Um, we're staying very busy right now. We got a bunch of our team that battling some illness, got some stuff going around. You know, I was sick a couple of weeks ago. I'm fine now, but a lot of my team is, uh, I, I promise I didn't get everybody sick, but it just seems like, uh, I can't imagine why. So we're having like 70 degree weather swings and stuff like that. But anyway, so we're all hanging in there, but uh, you know, we're a little busier than expected and we're having some people that are uh, not at full capacity, so. Appreciate your patience if you have had any delays there, but I think the team's been staying on top of things pretty well. Um, got some new stuff that has come in. <clears throat> a couple new Sun Lines a Day colors, which are fun. I love my Sun Lines a Day, still using it daily. And uh, we got uh, Emerald and Berry in, so you can check those colors out if you are so inclined. We also got um, some new Opus 88 color demonstrators. So this is basically a tinted colored version of the clear demo that we've had for a while or transparent whatever you want to call it so i've been using this one myself for a while big fan so we got some colored demos so i can show you what those are like now give you a little close up um, they are you know opacity is uh variable the orange one is definitely the most transparent and the translucent i should say and then there's a the smoke and the red and the smoke is just a little bit a hint of green to it it's like a gray green uh, and then the red is, of course, a nice pure red. The red and the smoke ones have black caps and black, or not black caps, but black finials on the caps and on the ends. The orange one is orange all the way through. So that's kind of a nice little aesthetic touch if you happen to be interested in getting a little color mixture there. Um, still eyedropper fill, number six size, Yovo Steel Nibs. Great performing pens. Just the clear ones have been really popular, so we wanted to try these tinted demos. So you can check those out on our site now. And I'm hoping now that they have the color demos and the clear, we'll have a good stock of, of all um, spread it around a little bit. So big fan of that pen. So you can check that out if you're interested. Um, we have some new Retro 51 pens. Specifically, um, we got the Mustang P51 available in a fountain now. Um, this is going to be available through all Retro 51 dealers, as well as fountain pen versions of Lincoln and Stealth. And then three new colors, which are three metallics, which I actually have in the rollerball version as well. Now, the fountain pen versions of these three are going to be available to all retro dealers, but the rollerballs we are doing as a Goulet exclusive. So I'll go ahead and give you a little close up at those. Really nice looking pens. I'm a big fan of retro. Uh, and their fountain pens. They've made some changes to their fountain pens. We had the Montana available uh, during the holiday season, very briefly. They came and went, um, but they changed the grip on these fountain pens. So that's different than what they um, had in previous ones. So they have a little more of a contoured grip now instead of a tapered grip. So to me, it feels like a better grip. The material that it's made of is a little better grip. Um, and then they went to Yovo nibs. They used to just be kind of generic Schmidt nibs. Um, they're unbranded Yovo nibs. They're going to look to do their own branding on their nibs, um, but they just haven't come in yet. So rather than continue to delay for months and months until they get their branded nibs, they're just putting unstamped nibs on their pens. So if you are an avid, avid retro fan, collector, um, it's actually kind of a brief window of time where they're gonna have these unbranded nibs on their pens. So. That could be a plus, that could be a minus for you. I don't know, but either way, I'm giving you the information. So that's what's happening. And then of course we have the, the fountain versions, these metallic ones. Um, these are going to be numbered limited edition pens. Um, 
and there's going to be 300 of each of them for now. I guess we have the option to continue them if we want to go beyond that, but 300 of a given rollerball color is kind of a lot, so we will see how they go, but we have them available for you uh, should you want them on our site. Um, we also got in the Diplomat Esteem Red. I alluded to this last week when I showed you the Esteem. We didn't have the red color in, and I have it now, so let me show you what it is. It's a like a shiny lacquer. Um, it's honestly, it's not quite as burgundy as what I was thinking based on the stock image that we were given. So we're going to work on doing photography of this um, at some point, but I at least wanted to show you in video to see what it looks like so you knew kind of what you were getting into. It's more of like a bright like Ferrari red than it is like a deep like fire engine or burgundy red. So um, just to let you know about that. But it's a nice mid mid range, mid price point pen, mid size, nice mid. It's just a mid pen, uh, you know, just one of those pens that fits nicely in the middle uh, of your your budget there in like that sixty to seventy dollar range, um, if you are so interested in that. And those have Yoba nibs on them as well. And then we have some new Colorverse Season Five colors. They're gonna be coming out. I don't have swabs of them or anything to share with you, but did want to give you a heads up that they're on the way. All right, I got, let's see here, how many questions? I got seven questions for you this week, so we're gonna get to it. We'll see how I do. First one is a pen and writing question from Brutus Biker, Brutus Biker on, Inst on Instagram. I have some pens whose ink lasts several months before drying out, but in some pens, the ink dries out in a couple of weeks. Is this due, if this is due to bad seals, why don't manufacturers solve this by making better seals? This has little to do with the cost of the pen. Um, well, that's that's sort of true. Um, sure, uh, there's engineering stuff involved, but they have to engineer pens anyway. Um, you know, definitely some pens do seal differently than others. That is true. I think there's a certain degree of engineering involved that makes some pens seal better than others. Um, you know. I, Without having like in-depth conversations with pen designers about this specific aspect, which of course you're prompting me with this question is like, why haven't I pushed for this more? Um, sometimes it's just an oversight. Sometimes it's just not the most important thing to a manufacturer, especially if you think about like some um, cultures uh, are much more into having just a couple of pens that they use regularly and they're not sitting unused for long periods of time, so it's just frankly not an issue for some uh, manufacturers. There's not something they hear about a lot. Um, I think there's a somewhat, I mean, there's been avid pen collectors um, for a long time, but I think the phenomenon of what we see and what I end up doing myself, of uh, I have a whole bunch of different pens, I like to ink up 10 or 20 of them at a time, and I might go for weeks or months where they sit kind of unused to the opportunity to dry out like that. Um, I think that's not always been the way that people have used their pens. Um, I think even people that were avid collectors like back in the day, um, 10 years or longer ago, um, were probably had a collection and would only still use a couple of pens at a time and would keep them like more steadily in the rotation. I'm completely speculating here. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, I hear more and more of people that are inking up 10, 20, or more pens at a time. So pens are sitting there inked, unused for longer periods of time. Now, of course, depending on the pen itself, the model, the ink that's used, the relative humidity in the air, there's a lot of different factors as to why a pen might dry out sooner than maybe another pen or another, you know, climate. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot of different factors here, but um, I do think that yes, manuf there are some manufacturers that could put inserts or do something with their pen design to seal it better so that it wouldn't be an issue and it would just, it would not dry out um, in the same time. Um, but I think for some, they're not quite thinking about it um, for like the whole being inked for months thing. And then I think others, um, you know, certain materials or certain aesthetics of the pen might be, I'm not gonna say compromised, but would have to be reconsidered um, by adding a nib insert in there. So it's not always such a no-brainer. Um, and again, I haven't had in in-depth conversations with manufacturers about this, but um, I'm definitely a fan of having pens that will seal better. Um, so this is giving me something to think about, and I'm gonna prompt all the manufacturers moving forward to be like, 
you should really be thinking about this more because this is becoming more of a thing. So I would love to get your feedback in the comments if this is like really resonating with you. Like, yes, pens drying out is a major issue for me and I will choose to buy one pen over another because manufacturers, they connect with that kind of thing. I will choose to buy one pen over another because it seals longer. That, that will be a huge selling point and that'll be something that manufacturers will listen to. So leave a note in the comments there. But anyway, I appreciate you asking the question and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's probing. All right, next one I have is from Eric H in an email. And Eric, I got to meet you in New York City. So that was pretty cool. Um, but you had a follow-up email with a good question. So I took it this week. Is there such a thing as a high quality international converter maker? Even the converters that come with my expensive pens look like they could be better engineered and made. Um, to a degree, there are some better versions of your standard international converter. Um, that's, that's one where there's probably the most variation. Um, but in general, it kind of reaches a certain degree of quality and then it really kind of stops. Um, I don't think it's something that a lot of manufacturers think about heavily, um, which is something that I don't understand there's a lot of manufacturers that still think cartridges uh, as their main thing. Um, that's uh, not definitely the way that most of our customers are using pens. I mean, it's, it's all about the ink, right? It's all about having bottles of ink. Um, so the, the converter oftentimes ends up being somewhat of an afterthought um, for most of the manufacturers, which seems crazy, but it kind of is how they think about it sometimes. Um, showing you some of the standard international converters that I have, um, you know, there's definitely different versions that you can get. Uh, and I'll try to show and explain some of the differences here. You know, some of the less expensive ends, you have ones like the one that comes free with a Jinhao pen. You know, these are not meant to last forever. They're coming on a very inexpensive pen. You know, the pen itself may cost less. I'm thinking like a Jinhao Shark pen may cost less than just a standard international converter, period. A um, couple of cheaper versions here. Usually the cheaper versions will have like a frosted kind of plastic to them. They'll have just plastic on the ends, no metal components really of any kind. This one doesn't even have a metal shroud. There's no metal in this one at all. It's just pure plastic. Um, this one, these, these I've collected over the years. I don't even know exactly where these came from. Um, this one's got a bit of a metal shroud. Um, it's getting closer to more of our recognizable standard international. Um, this one here is uh, Monteverde had this on their Artista Crystal when that pen first came out, and it's kind of known as the Artista Crystal Converter now, even though it's available on a bunch of other pens. Online converter is similar to this one as well. Um, and then this one is more of the standard, um, you know, Schmidt is a major manufacturer for converters. This is known as the Schmidt K5. So this is kind of like the gold standard, the Schmidt K5, um, for standard international converters. It's got a different type of plastic, a harder plastic. Um, you know, more durable plastic than what you have on like these, you know, soft, softer frosted kind of ones. Um, it's got a clear body here. It's got the metal shrouds for more reinforcement. Um, it's kind of the smoothest action. These are going to be some of the nicer ones you have. Um, there is a slightly nicer version I've seen on a couple of different brands, Delta before they went away. Uh, Visconti has one. So I don't know how widely available this is, but it, maybe it's an option. Um, but this is kind of like the highest end uh, converter that I've seen, especially in the standard international. So this is a threaded standard international, and it's got this metal shroud on the back. Now, I don't know if this actually makes the converter any better. It certainly feels better. I suspect that it's pretty much a metal shroud over top, so it's like you're not touching plastic, you're touching metal. Um, I don't know that the internal mechanisms are really any uh, different necessarily. It doesn't seem to be the case, but it definitely feels higher end, that little shroud in the back. So, you know, it's the kind of thing that, does that even make a difference? I don't know. The thing you got to keep in mind with all of these converters is they're essentially meant to be replaceable. Um, so they're only going to develop them to be so nice. Now, I personally feel like there is room to make them a little bit nicer exactly what that would look like. I don't know, but it's amazing. It's still amazing to me how many manufacturers really don't think that heavily about the converter, even though it's such a big part of the fountain pen experience. But it's just uh, one of those things that I gotta keep, I gotta keep hounding on them about that because um, most manufacturers are not actually manufacturing their own converters. Um, 
Most of them are buying them come from a company like Schmidt. Um, and Schmidt is the one that's, you know, maybe making most of these things. I don't know. There could be other manufacturers out there. I'm sure Jin Hao is probably getting theirs made somewhere else. Um, but it's the same kind of thing, like, you know, just a little bit of increase in quality of something like a converter would would enhance your experience with a pen, um, you know, so much. Uh, I, I know it's difficult because it's a component of the pen. You don't even see it uh, except when you're filling the pen. So I don't know. It's it's got me thinking a lot, and I would, I'm going to encourage some manufacturers to really think about it. But I'm not aware of any like super ultra premium converter that's out there. The Schmidt K5 is really kind of the gold standard, um, and a lot of people are pretty happy with that. But definitely, like the metal shrouded one that I showed you, and I'm now seem to have misplaced somewhere. Oh, I put it back in the pen. <laughs> that one is kind of the one that I think, you know, really feels the most premium. Um, but yeah, that's kind of all I got for you. So sorry, I don't have a great answer for you, Eric, but uh, you know, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much where we're at these days. All right, again, ink question from John O on Facebook. Uh, I have limited edition inks. Only 40 bottles will ever be made. Should I save them? Uh, with the thought that they'll appreciate in value. Is the value in using the ink? Should I figure out a way to share the ink with others? Um, you know, this is an interesting question, um, especially thinking about, you know, anything limited edition. Um, you see a lot of limited edition things these days. It was definitely true in like the 90s. There was a huge heyday of limited edition pens and things like that. Um, I'm starting to see now um, people that really collected a lot of pretty nice limited edition pens back in the 90s, early 2000s and things that are now clearing out their collections, either voluntarily to pare things down um, or involuntarily, like maybe they passed away and their stuff is coming up is in kind of an estate auction type situation. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of um, what was once limited edition things. They're not necessarily going for a premium. Um, so I think that's something to think about. I know it's talking about pens um, and it's going to be like any other niche collectible type of thing. It's going to be really hit or miss what's going to appreciate in value and what's not because it's all going to ebb and flow based on the popularity of things. Um, you know, personally, uh, I think it's, it's really kind of a gamble to think if it's going to appreciate in value. So I lean a little bit more towards the, if you like the ink, then you should use it. Um, if you get a limited edition color, there's 40 bottles and you're not that hot on the color or it's like that color really kind of looks exactly like this other brand's ink that is not limited edition. Let me just use that and maybe just keep it in the box and you want to keep it. But it's really a very personal choice. Um, I, I have ink that is limited, not limited edition, like only 40 bottles numbered, that kind of thing. Um, but I have ones that were seasonal or special edition kind of thing that I don't use, you know, just because, well, for one, I have a lot of choices of ink. Um, so probably I would use it if I didn't have so many inks at my disposal. Um, but also it's just like, I know it's gonna go away. And there's certain ones like if I absolutely love it, yeah, I'm gonna use it anyway. Um, but other ones, it's like, if I can find a substitutionary color, I'm just going to use that and then hang on to the limited edition. Not really because I feel like it's going to appreciate a lot in value. Like say I buy a bottle of ink for $20 and it ends up being worth $30 or $40. Like I'm not really going to retire on that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so you just gotta, you gotta make your own call. You know, I would say if you have a lot of replaceable substitutionary inks, go ahead and do it. But you know, just set it aside and don't use it. Use something else different. But otherwise, if you're really hot on a certain ink, you love it, just go ahead and use it. You know, use it up and keep the bottle maybe when it's empty and all that, or use half of it and keep half the bottle because there's still value to that if it's a particularly amazing color. But it's pretty rare to have like any limited type ink really skyrocket in value enough there. You'll just really be kicking yourself um, if you didn't stock up on it. And if you really feel like there's a like, financial component, like if you really want to go all in, maybe you're a big risk taker and you just want to go nuts and you really think that you're going to find the next Parker Penman Sapphire or something like Lamy Dark Lilac, because some of those inks do end up selling for a ridiculous amount for a time on eBay and that kind of thing. Um, if you really believe that strongly in it, you should really buy up multiple bottles and try and flip them and make some money on it anyway. Um, and then just keep one of the bottles for yourself to use, you know, but if you only have one bottle and that's it and that's all you're ever going to have, I say just do whatever you want with it, but you should probably just lean towards enjoying it yourself. All right. Business questions. 
got a bunch of these this week. Um, so, Ostlosada on Instagram. Um, let's admit that there's been a revival in fountain pens. Realistically, where do you see fountain pens and the fountain pen community in 10 years? Oh gosh, well, I'm not afraid to admit that I think, <laughs> I don't think it's a big secret. Um, but yeah, um, so I'll admit it. Um, it's a great question. You know, I was thinking about this uh, because it's been about 10 years uh, since I got into fountain pens. It'll be 10 years this summer when I really started to, to use fountain pens for myself. And then of course, Goulet pens were hitting our, what we consider to be our 10th anniversary uh, of when we started selling fountain pen goods anyway, uh, on November 17th of 2019. That'll be our 10th anniversary. So, um, you know, thinking about that, I, it's funny, I actually, um, I meant to look at this ahead of time. Let me try to find my journal. Um, but I have a journal that I wrote in when I first started to do the pen thing. And uh, I think I pulled this out maybe once before. This is a Quavatis Habana with white paper from way back in the day. Um, they haven't had white paper in probably nine years. Um, so let me see, it's kind of cool because I actually wrote in my journal around the time that I first got into fountain pens, um, and I was thinking about what is gonna be happening 20 years from now. And uh, that will be 10 years from now is when this journal that I was speculating on will come to fruition. So let me find this thing. See, I have notes from the first time I read Crush It. Um, you can see here, this is the first time that I've written on Claire Fontaine paper. And so I just had kind of a stream of consciousness. First time I wrote with Jerobon Inc. Um, yeah, Jerobon Inc. for the first time. Eclat de Saphir uh, was the first ink that I'd ever used. So yeah, lots of fun stuff. My sister-in-law wrote in this. <laughs> I have like notes from my infant care class for when my son was gonna be born for the first time. I mean, he was only born once, but yeah. when my first child was born, I should say. Um, let's see here, some interesting stuff in this notebook. But I had one point in here, where is it? Okay, um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, I have this list. I've talked about this before, about starting a blog. Um, uh, and uh, one of the things that I read, this is a tangent, but I'm just going down memory lane here, if you'll indulge with me. Um, so. One of the first things that I read was that if you can think of 50 different ideas, uh, at least 50 ideas for a blog, then you should definitely start a blog. This was a written blog back when they were all the rage. Um, and so I did. I came up with apparently 84 different things. Um, and I think I've accomplished two or three of them <laughs> after 1,600 videos now. Um, so yeah, did not have a shortage of content. Um, my notes from Crush It, the first time I read Gary Vaynerchuk's book. And uh, let's see here, I read Seth Godin, his book, Tribes. Um, let's see here, there's one part. Um, okay, this part. Um, da -da 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 -da. I said something about, okay. What I struggle with about the blog is what Gary V said in his book about being an expert so that people will return to you. It will be 20 years before I would consider myself to be an expert in, in a lot of this stuff. For Gary, I think people rely a great deal on his palette and colorful descriptions of the wine he's tasting. I'm just not sure if the exact formula applies for the products I'll be reviewing for the Ink Nouveau. We'll just have to find out. Ink Nouveau is what we used to call the blog and YouTube channel. So it's just interesting. I wrote this, gosh, when did I write this? I think I dated it. Um, January 3rd, 2010. So it was actually more like nine years ago. So, um, you know, I, but literally I wrote, it will be 20 years before I would consider myself an expert. So I guess I got uh, 11 years to go or close to it. Um, but still, it's interesting because I still have that original journal. Um, and, you know, it's just funny to think about where I was gonna be there. Um, so where do I see the community being in 10 years? I totally didn't answer your question at all. Um, I just thought that was kind of funny um, that that timing kind of worked out. So I see fountain pens continuing to be very much a niche interest. I don't think they're gonna go mainstream. I really, just realistically and thinking about like, you know, vinyl records and wet shaving and these types of things that there is somewhat a revival of these things, 
but they're only going to be a revival but for so much and they're always going to remain a niche interest i think there's a lot of things that have had a resurgence due to the internet due to social media and people being able to connect with each other and share their enthusiasm around some of these hobbies um, i don't think that we're going to go back to using fountain pens in school as a primary method of writing and communication because that's just not the way the world's going we've got to be realistic but i do think fountain pens are going to receive um, a new revival in a, in a place in our culture, even if it's a subculture of sorts. Um, I'm seeing a lot of interest and a lot of articles and things that aren't even related to the fountain pen community necessarily, but things around writing, journaling, um, things about like journaling around, you know, um, helping with anxiety and depression, journaling as a method of keeping your brain sharp in your older years, um, you know, and a lot of just um, self affirmations and good mental health stuff around journaling and, and physically writing things down. I think that, you know, mental health is a huge issue in the US, probably many other parts of the world. And I think that there's probably more of a connection that's gonna be made around actually writing, journaling, and that type of thing, uh, and tying that to mental health in some way. So I think that if there's more of a renewed interest in studies and stuff that will happen around mental health, um, it's possible that writing could be um, more closely associated with helping with that. And of course, fountain pens, are a way that you can really enjoy the writing experience a lot not and receive less friction in your writing, especially if you're writing for long times with stream of consciousness type of thing. I think a fountain pen is one of the best ways to do that. So I could see that being something that would um, bring it maybe a little bit more into the consciousness of society. Um, I could see, you know, just handwriting and journaling in general, not necessarily with the pens as standalone tools, um, but kind of uh, riding the wave of some of those things. Bullet journaling really caught on for the last several years in the pen community. I think bullet journaling is now um, getting caught more into outside of the pen community. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Um, I think pen stores in general are going to continue to see a change. They have been seeing a change in the last 10, 15 years. Brick and mortar stores, like all brick and mortar stores, are being challenged, um, especially ones that are really niche interests like you know, pens. Um, I think that um, physical brick and mortar stores are going to become more destination locations. They're going to be less just kind of ever present. I think a lot of your like major office supply stores and stuff like that are going to be challenged greatly. Um, and so you're not going to see this stuff like widely available. It's going to be very much specialty stores. Um, and then online, of course, is going to continue to remain um, a huge part, probably dominate um, worldwide over time. Um, you know, even in more established countries that have brick and mortar presences, the online is just going to, it's going to be undeniable um, uh, how influential that will be in the pen community. Um, it's hard to say like where the community as a whole is going to be, you know, thinking about like where we were 10 years ago, where we're going to be 10 years from now, you know, Instagram wasn't even invented 10 years ago. <laughs> so uh, it's going to be interesting to think like what could possibly be around 10 years from now that hasn't even been created yet. And especially thinking about like the speed at which new platforms are being adopted and attaining kind of their, you know, I know one benchmark is like the 100 million user per month um, thing. Uh, I think that that's, uh, you're seeing faster and faster uh, adoption of new platforms. Like, you know, Facebook took so much time, Instagram took so much time, you know, Snapchat, and then like, I think Twitch took like, you know, nine months or something to, to reach the 100 million user mark. So it's like each new platform that's reaching that mark is happening faster and faster. So. Um, I think that probably there's going to be something dominant in the community that maybe hasn't even been invented yet um, that will be 10 years from now. I'm curious to see what form that will take. Um, but especially thinking about where like VR, AR, a lot of things are going to be heading in the next 10 years. That's You're not going to be like wearing contact lenses with, you know, three-dimensional like pens that you'll like hold in your hand virtually and be writing virtually. Maybe. I don't know. 10 years from now, probably not. 30 years from now? Who knows? Um, but it'll be interesting to see just like where our community is congregating uh, online. But I think that'll be a that'll be a pretty big deal. Um, the whole online um, connectedness presence will be pretty big. Um, let's see here. I think there will be some smaller manufacturers that are going to crop up. You know, some others that are even going to grow and expand. Who are maybe small now, they're going to grow even bigger. You know, think about a brand like Noodlers or Twisby. You know, where there are relatively small. Um, company compared to some of the, the older and more dominant ones. 
um, but they are making more of a name for themselves. I think you're going to see more of that happening over the next 10 years in the pen world, um, especially as the community gets more established and social media and stuff gives exposure to smaller manufacturers. Um, I think you're going to see the typical um, you know, distribution relationship within the pen world to be challenged pretty greatly. Um, thinking about even just beyond the pen world, you're seeing companies like Nike, you know, they used to have all of their new release shoes happen at like Foot Locker or whatever. Um, and now you're just not seeing that as much. You see kind of their regularly offered stuff there, but when they have major new launches, they're selling direct, you know, and they're going direct, they're cutting out a lot of the distribution chain. Now, granted, that's a much larger industry. Whether you're gonna see that happen in the fountain pen world necessarily, probably not because you don't have manufacturers that are nearly that big and have that infrastructure in place. But certainly you're starting to see some brands, some manufacturers who have a much flatter um, you know, distribution model. You don't have you know, a manufacturer with you know, a global distributor and local distributors, retailers, whatever. You're gonna see much less middlemen, uh, for lack of better terms, and I would consider myself to be one of those middle people. Um, you know, as a retailer. So you're going to see manufacturers selling direct. You know, think about like Twisby as an example. Like Twisby sells direct um, to you and they will interact with you directly. They also sell through a few select retailers, but that's it. That's a whole distribution chain right there. So they don't have, you know, distributors all over the place. Um, you know, and so they're able to stay much more affordable, a little flatter structure. Um, and things like that. So I think you're going to see more, sort of like you have like micro brews and craft brews and stuff like that um, in the the brewery world. You're going to end up with like behemoths who, you know, are completely dominating the market. And then you're going to end up with a a ton of smaller manufacturers that aren't set up for huge widespread distribution, but that are able to make like these craft products and they can make things in small batch kind of things. You're going to see that uh, you're already are seeing that in the pen world. You're seeing a lot of smaller manufacturers that are selling direct or doing shows or just through their website or have one or two select um, retailers that they work closely with. And then that's kind of as much as they really want to grow. Um, you know, so I, that's that to me is incredibly interesting to see where that will go. Um, for us, we definitely plan to stay around. Um, we're going to continue putting out great content and service. What that looks like 10 years from now, who knows? We haven't really changed drastically that much in the last 10 years. Um, you know, uh, we've, we've kind of doubled down on certain things and there have been platforms that have come up and, you know, heavy on the customer service side of things, but we haven't changed that too much. I think there's like core principles of how we're going to operate as Goulet Pens, um, exactly how and what form that's going to take is kind of yet to be seen. But I definitely think, um, you know, going more in the one-on-one -on -one kind of curated experience is probably going to have to happen. Um, as it is right now in the fountain pen world, when you as a newbie coming into the world, you're exposed to these pens through whatever means. You might see some pictures on Instagram or you're exposed to a video through a recommendation from YouTube um, and you kind of stumble into it and you're like, well, that seems kind of interesting. You might hear about us or our site and you kind of stumble in and you're like, what are all these brands? What is going on here? I think what you're going to see is you're going to see more sophistication in general around a lot of niche interests, but especially with you know fountain pens. Um, I think you're going to see more of a curated, individualized experience welcoming you into whatever that hobby is, right? So like we're thinking about that right right now at Goulet Pens. We have a ton of content. We have Fountain Pen 101, which is helpful. We have some online tools, which are really helpful. Pen Plaza, Swap Shop, Nib Nook, these types of things. Um, but we don't have like one place that when you come to our site is like, here you go. Welcome to the site. Here's the rundown. Here's the world that you stepped into. Let's give you the rundown. Let's walk you through it. Here's a series of newsletters to help you out and introduce you to all this. You know, we don't, we're working on developing that better, but largely it's people that they call it falling down the rabbit hole. You kind of stumble into this world, you get interested, you learn about smatterings of things all over the place, and then you kind of fall into the community, you love the community, and then you start to just explore, you get a bunch of pens, you try them out, and you figure out kind of as you go. I could see much more sophistication around, you know, different people, your interests that you have, um, and, and where you're finding out about different products and having much more of a curated kind of welcoming experience. I could see that getting much more sophisticated around all areas of retail in the next 10 years, not just pens. 
Um, and then I just see the community maturing more, you know, connecting more, having even stronger uh, connectedness, maybe probably more of an emphasis on physical gatherings. Um, I think that, you know, physical pen shows, like in-person pen shows, went through a bit of a dip, and then now they're kind of coming a little bit more in vogue, um, especially as people are really connected online, and then they can actually go to a place where there are pens and being able to meet up. Um, it, the next 10 years is going to be interesting to see how that happens. I definitely see, you know, some shows where it's like the old guard who've been doing the shows for 10, 15, 20 plus years that are kind of doing it the way they've always done it. Um, some of that may get disrupted in the next 10 years, um, whether it's, you know, they're just aging out and they're not able to kind of keep doing it and they kind of pass the torch or whether they're just the show kind of collapses and shuts down and then the new one has to kind of rise up and take it over. Um, I definitely think there's a huge opportunity, huge opportunity at pen shows to integrate more social content. There's definitely like, you know, call it what you will, but like pen celebrities who are doing reviews and blogs and all that kind of stuff that are organically, they're just kind of showing up at the pen shows. They're bringing a lot of attention and stuff like that. But I could definitely see more of a partnership between pen shows and the people that are deep, deep, deep into the pen world and have some influence there to host some things and make it a more cohesive experience. Um, right now, it's pretty much just people show up and things kind of happen, you know, on the fly. Um, you know, I could see I could see much more um, of a curated experience happening physically in person. Maybe there's more meetups that start to happen locally. You know, just as people connect more, and you know, even just like our Goulet Nation group, you know, people connecting more and, and having meetups that are cropping up locally. You know, all across the country, um, I could see that being an interesting thing. But I'm very optimistic. You know, I don't think that fountain pens are going to become irrelevant in the next 10 years. At least we are fighting hard around here to keep that from happening. Um, um, but 10 years is a long time, it's hard to say. So we're trying to keep uh, current, trying to keep top of mind for a lot of folks and uh, introduce more people into this wild, wonderful world. So anyway, those are just some bleh, kind of top of mind thoughts that I had uh, within the last 24 hours as I jotted down these notes for what's gonna happen in the next 10 years. All right, next question is from Joe B on Facebook. You have in past videos shown us where in your office you have a dedicated pen cleaning station, but can you expand on that? Is pen cleaning an office event, or is it one of those things where you need to clean, you just go do it? Also, what supplies are at the cleaning station that makes it easier for yourself and your team to clean what I assume are a moderate number of pens on a regular basis? Yeah, so the pen cleaning station here definitely gets pretty regular use. Um, we don't have like pen cleaning parties or anything like that. It's really up to the individual to clean out pens. Sometimes we're cleaning out things that might be a return that was inked up and we need to clean it out and inspect it. So there's like a, you know, definitely like a, a part of our, our process um, of, of just our normal workday that, that happens. But we're also signing a lot of handwritten notes. So we are using our own pens on a pretty regular basis. Um, and plus a lot of us just like to use pens. So we just use them just for our daily note taking or whatever else. Um, so certainly that is uh, the opportunity that's here for everybody. So it's really just a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. So um, uh, I'm gonna switch over to my cell phone and just grab a quick shot of the pen cleaning station. Audio is gonna be a little bit rough. Video is gonna be a little hackneyed. Um, so sorry, Andy, <laughs> as we're editing this together. Um, and I'll just kind of show you all, give you a little tour of our pen cleaning station. So let's head on over there and take a look. All right, so walking through our kitchen here. Over here, if you turn to the side, this is our pen cleaning station. And uh, one of the first things we have is this nice light that's right over top so that you get nice focused um, stuff going on over here. We opted for two sinks because, you know, if one person's cleaning, you can have several pens to clean out at once. It can get kind of involved. Um, but it's a nice little station over here. We made it standing height because we figure that's pretty much the situation people are gonna be in here at work ready to go. And then just some of the um, key features that we have. Nice little swivel sinks with a, you know, handle that can turn into a spray. Not that that gets used for pen stuff, but maybe when you're spraying the ink down or something. We went for a white Formica countertop, which is the absolute worst choice for an ink cleaning station, but it matched the aesthetics, so that's why we went with it. And then just some of the materials that we have over here, just kind of your typical stuff, nothing too crazy. It is communal, so it does tend to get a little disheveled from time to time, as most office-y things do. But we got, you know, standard cups that you can fill with water, you know, ink syringes, bulb syringes, both 
uncut and cut, depending on if you're using something like a pilot. Um, the cut ones tend to work a little bit better. Goulet grips, just various things for taking pens apart and whatnot. Of course, we have basically an endless supply of pen flush with multiple bottles there that we can use um, and makes things nice and easy. And then, of course, we have a paper towel dispenser with some spare paper towels, uh, Q-tips, things like that. Just make it easier to um, do our thing. We do have an ultrasonic cleaner. The one oversight we did not have when building the station is we don't have an electrical outlet at the pen cleaning station. So if we're using the um, ultrasonic cleaner, we have to go bring it somewhere else. Not a huge deal. We're not ultrasonic cleaning a whole lot of things here, but that happens. And then of course we have our array of hand sanitizers, cleaners, and this stuff, which is like, um, you know, a more aggressive cleaner, sort of like an Agent Orange type of, not Agent Orange, that was, wasn't that what they used in Vietnam? Anyway, um, like that like orange pumice kind of um, material, that's kind of like what this stuff is. Just helps get the ink off the hands a little bit. It does okay. It's not miraculous, but it's better than just plain soap. So anyway, and we have gloves here for anyone who's really just not wanting to get ink on their fingers or has some fancy, you know, date night to go on with their significant other and doesn't want ink all over their fingers. Um, they have that there. So there you go. That is a Goulet pen cleaning station. Back to you, Brian. All right. Thanks, Brian. Good to be back. <laughs> All right. Christine K on Facebook has the next question. You've mentioned a few business or leadership self-growth books. Sounds like a health issue uh, that you've read and refer back to as references. Do you make those books titles or copies of the books themselves available to team members to read? And if so, are there opportunities for them to ask questions or discuss observations with you and or other leaders in the company? Um, I don't have like a master list of all the books that I've ever read published anywhere for my team members to see. I haven't really been asked about that. I haven't really thought about it. I've read probably 130 books at this point, um, somewhere around there. I lost count. But, um, you know, it's definitely something that uh, I'm, I'm not like trying to hide. I'm, I'm open to it. Maybe I'll publish a list after this just because, um, you know, why not? Uh, so, you know, I've read a lot that I've like, I have a lot, you know, you can see some of, well, there's a good number of them here. I have probably, you know, a bunch more at home. A lot of the books I've read have been audiobooks too. So this isn't even all of them. Um, uh, you know, I'll loan them out from time to time. I've taken notes in a lot of these books, you know, some which might be like more private. So I, I try, I, I maybe won't loan out ones that I've taken like heavy, heavy notes in. Um, but uh, I'm absolutely cool with like loaning books, buying books for my team. Um, not as big on loaning books, especially business books, because honestly, I would rather just give them to my team and, and let them have it and use it and give it to somebody else if they find value in it. So a lot of times if I have a team member that comes up and has interest in it and I'm a big proponent of the book, I'm like, yeah, definitely here, I'll get you a copy, you know, or, or we'll make sure that you have a chance to read it. I actually provide a budget to each member of my team for training, um, which can encompass books. Um, so they don't even have to ask questions. They can just, um, you know, talk with their leader and just buy books that they want for their own, um, you know, development. Um, we have certain books that we've read here uh, on a pretty regular basis, like QBQ. I'm a big fan of that one by John G. Miller. Um, read this um, excerpts of it in front of my whole company in front of the company meetings over like five or six weeks. Um, so this one, we actually have like a stockpile of these in our um, HR director's office. And anybody who's interested, we just like throw it at them. We're like, here, read this book. It's amazing. Um, you know, our leadership team right now, we're reading a book by Dr. Brene Brown called Dare to Lead. She is a freaking rock star and I love her. Um, so we're reading that. We've read, um, you know, Good to Great. We've read The Ideal Team Player, you know, as a leadership team. Um, the Advantage is another really good book. So yeah, I have a number of books that I'm a proponent of and are kind of like woven into a lot of the, whether the meeting rhythms or the interpersonal things that we've done. Um, read Emotional Intelligence 2.0 as a leadership team. So there's a lot of stuff that um, we as a leadership team have read and talked very openly about. And of course, if there's any interest from any of our team, um, we'll throw a book at them. Um, but uh, um, those are all really good. Um, but we're having regular one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, you know, maybe not weekly, maybe every, every, every other week, but it's at, at least once or twice a month. Um, we're meeting each team member with their leader, sitting down in a meeting together. So certainly there's plenty of opportunity to have like scheduled, like kind of productive 
uh, time there to discuss things, but it's also very organic. Like I might be washing out my dish after lunch and somebody comes up and asks me a question about something and I'm talking about whatever I've read or they might ask me a question specifically about a book um, and I'll kind of go on and talk about concepts or somebody else is listening to a podcast and I mentioned some other thing that I've read, you know. Um, so a, a lot of it's very organic, super open, just as you can probably imagine sitting here talking in this video. If somebody comes up and asks me something, about pens or leadership or you know any of this type of stuff that I'm just like naturally sharing anyway, um, you can bet that I'm, I'm gonna probably be late to my next meeting because I'm talking to somebody about whatever that thing is um, because I am a big fan of it. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much what we do. I'm, I'm a big fan of the leaders, our readers. Um, so I encourage as much of that as I can and leadership can take many forms. It doesn't have to mean you're a manager position at a given company. You know, you can be a leader of your family, you can be a leader in your, you know, church or volunteer organization or, you know, group of friends or whatever it is. I think leadership is something that is a skill that can be tremendously helpful in a lot of different ways, not necessarily just in, just in your job. So I'm a big fan of that kind of stuff um, if people are receptive to it. Cool. The last question I have for this week, this is from Solly S. on YouTube. What's your relationship like with other pen retailers like Anderson Pens, Jet Pens, etc.? Do you see them as partners in servicing and educating the community or as more traditional business rivals? How do you react when you see them doing similar things like you, uh, or sorry, similar things to you like YouTube videos? Um, I don't know, are traditional business rivals, is that a thing? Uh, you know, I th honestly think like, it's all a matter of mentality. Um, I love the pen industry because honestly, most of the people here are super friendly. Like you think the pen, the pen community is really friendly in itself. I think a lot of that too happens a lot in the, um, on the, 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 the retailing and distribution side of things too. A lot of different manufacturers who may could consider themselves to be competitors are remarkably friendly with each other. Um, a lot of the distributors and retailers who are kind of in the business, you know, we're not here in the pen business. None of us retailers, you know, distributors, whatever. We're not here because this is the thing we could be doing to make the most money. You know, there are a lot of industries out there. Think of whichever come to mind that you you perceive um, where money and and all that kind of stuff is the main motivation, the main goal, prestige, fame, wealth, whatever it might be. That's not really what's going on in most of the pen world. It's pretty much a passion driven industry. Um, everything from the people that use the products, you all, um, those who are helping to distribute them in whatever fashion, like retailers like me, and those who are manufacturing them, no one is really doing it because it is the most lucrative and easiest and simplest opportunity out there as a business venture. So those who are doing it really do it because they love it, especially the ones who stick around in it for like decades or generations. They're really doing it because it's romantic, they have a passion for it, they're drawn to it, and they just couldn't see themselves doing anything different. And there's something about when you're in an industry where everybody's connected to each other by passion, sometimes you can get that passion can turn into, you know, competitiveness for sure, uh, to a degree, but largely everybody has the greater perspective in mind, which is we are in a niche hobby. The biggest competition that we all have as retailers is obsolescence. Like I'm not competing with another retailer to try to sell a pen. I'm competing with the iPhone and Amazon, you know, who is selling everything. You know, it's like, I'm really competing with the fountain pen itself becoming irrelevant to society and then no one wants it anymore. That's really the competition here. Um, and I think most retailers really kind of understand that. Those that don't, it's, it's, it's understandable because that is kind of more of what you're calling like the traditional business rival kind of mentality, which is, um, you know, I think it doesn't just happen in business, it can happen in relationships, it can happen really all over the place. Um, it's the scarcity versus abundance mentality. And I think there are some people, really business is just all people. There are some people, and I'm speaking very generally here, not towards any specific retailer or, or competitor of mine, um, but there are some people who just view things in terms of scarcity, whether it's terms of their friendships, uh, relationships, attention from people that are close to them, fame, you know, money, business, whatever it might be, they view it as, you know, 
I am in constant competition with other people because there's only so much to be had. Uh, and if I don't get what's mine, and if I don't go after it, it will be taken from me and it will not be available to me. Um, that is the scarcity mentality. For me, I view it as more of an abundance mentality. Whereas, um, okay, for using the pen industry as an example, okay, there are so many people right now that have an awareness of fountain pens, that have a budget and the means to get fountain pens. Um, and that is one way to view it is I have to go after and, and any competitor who's out there, if they sell a pen, that means I'm not selling that pen. That would be the scarcity mentality. For me though, it's an abundance mentality of, okay, they just sold a pen. Now that person has more experience with a pen, they might show that pen to somebody else. Let me think about what I can do to help grow the entire interest in fountain pens. There's such an abundance of people, attention, money, especially in a niche hobby like fountain pens. There is so much more opportunity for more people to come into an awareness around pens and appreciate them. Um, and that's where I want to focus my efforts, not on trying to fight over, you know, the people who are already like shopping to buy a pen today. Excuse me. So I've taken a very long term view on that over the last 10 years, really, which is why I put out so many videos, so many blogs, so many Instagram photos and, you know, Facebook posts and things like that is because we are trying to grow awareness and interest in fountain pens as a whole. Um, there's a phrase that I absolutely love that's the rising tide raises all ships. That's really how I and a lot of people in the fountain pen retailing community view it, which is, okay, we can all be in a room, like a pen shows is a perfect example, because you are literally next to your competition trying to sell stuff. And there is a little bit of back and forth and stuff like that that happens. It's largely very friendly. But like even at a pen show, you know, people who are like selling and kind of competing with each other, they'll like wrap up the show and they'll all go out and like have dinner together. I'm not like deeply plugged into that, to the pen show community, but I know enough and I've, and I've had dinner with, you know, people that I do business with at pen shows and stuff. And that's large, that's largely what happens. It's like, you know, sort of like if you're an athlete, like you'll compete on the field, but then you'll like go and you'll hang out, you know, after the fact. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, we're all winning because we all get to do something that we love. So me personally, I, I, I see, you know, a bit of a mixture of things going on in the pen community. Um, there's definitely some times where, you know, somebody will, will, you know, do something in the pen community. I'm speaking very generally here because I never like to talk bad about a competitor. Um, but there might be somebody that does one thing and somebody else kind of mimics it, you know, and I think like imitation is the greatest form of flattery. You know, we have, we have had instances in the past where, you know, a competitor will take copy right off our website or take dimensions or take various things, copy things. We've had people rip off images before, you know, and take out our watermark back when we used to do that. You know, that kind of stuff is like, that gets pretty annoying because <laughs> it's like, all right, we did that work and you're just, you're just literally taking that work and trying to profit off of it. That doesn't happen a lot, especially not with major competitors like, you know, Jet Pens and Andersons. They're not, do they're not really doing that kind of stuff. It's largely like people that are trying to like flip stuff on eBay, you know, and, and like more one-offs kind of thing that, that happens more. Um, but, uh, you know, it definitely can happen where, you know, there's more of a competition with, with um, creating content and stuff like that. The stuff that's a little more um, nebulous. Um, so uh, I think that as a whole, you know, that kind of stuff isn't really happening as much. And, and honestly, like the approach that we've always taken here has been, you know, anybody can take you know, product descriptions off our website or images or whatever, like, you know, we try to make it a stamp of our own, but, but that stuff is, is very stealable. But the humans that we have here in our office, the people, the personalities, the style that we have, that really can't just be copied or taken. Or even if somebody did it exactly like we do it, they're not gonna thrive because that's not genuinely them. So what I always encourage and I love to see in the pen community, and largely I do see that, is all the individual retailers focusing on their strengths, finding their best avenues, and really focusing on what they know and do best. And I think that's something that's really developed over the last 10 years since we've been in this, is it's not so much that everybody seems more or less generic and replaceable, and then 
you know, you might as well shop at one place over another. And, you know, if everybody seems the same, it's more of a commodity. Price goes down, service usually goes down, and it becomes a race to the bottom. That's not happened as much in the fountain pen community. I've seen a lot more individual retailers kind of specializing in certain things, you know? It's like the, the Andersons, for example, they have a, like an Estabrook background, a strong vintage, so they've got their own style. They do the pen shows, they've got physical brick and mortar stores that are doing well, so I hear. So it's like, cool, like that's great. Like I, that's not the route that we've gone, but to see them thriving in that way, like they're growing the community, that's really awesome. To see others that are focused more on like nib tuning, to see others that are focusing on like, you know, Jet Pens has more of like the, the Japanese products and like, you know, the, the felt tips and markers and the, you know, the, the more stylized like themed like erasers and like all that kind of stuff. Like that's really cool. Like they've got their niche and we've got our thing. And it's really cool to see there's overlap, but everybody's kind of coming into their own. So I think that's something really interesting that's happened in recent years. Um, and I fully, fully support that. Like I'm all about people like, you know, being personal, sharing their knowledge, engaging with the community in their own way. I would love nothing more than to people, you know, every retailer who, who is in this space to copy that method, you know, which is what we've tried to do. Um, not necessarily copy the things we say and the way we do things and the products and the way, the way that we try to, to display them, but the, I, just the more the mentality of like, we're going to study our products, we're going to really engage with our community and and serve up and, and be an expert in our own kind of passion and interest. I think that, that that is like the best way to go about it. And that's largely what I'm seeing happen in the pen community. So it's really fun just behind the scenes to be involved in that. There's not there's not really any animosity. There might be some, you know, little spats here and there that are gonna happen just because it's all humans, you know? Um, but there's no like deep seated bad blood that I'm aware of um, for really any of the the pen manufacturer, the pen retailers um, that you're thinking about. It's largely, it's, it's, it's an incredibly civil community from an engagement side and it's an incredibly civil uh, community from like the retailing and distribution side. So uh, much more so than I think in probably a lot of other industries out there. So that's why I love it every day. I just absolutely love it. It's, uh, it's, like, it's like I'm home every day. All right, my question of the week for you this week is, what is your pen cleaning routine? Do you have a special place um, that you clean your pens? What tools do you use? That kind of thing. I'm very curious. I know it's a ritual that we all uh, have the opportunity to embark on on a regular basis as we're in this hobby. And I'm very curious to know how you like to do it, where you do it, and that kind of thing. So if you just leave in the comments, what's your pen cleaning routine? I'd love to hear about that. Um, you can subscribe to our channel, leave comments, give us a like. All that stuff is super helpful for us to, you know, have YouTube like us more and share us with more people. So thank you for doing that. Um, you can check out a lot of what I talked about on GoulayPens.com. Thank you so much for watching. Have a fantastic week.